Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Jensen with Trees Forever. It's uh, just a couple of minutes before noon. If you're here for the uh, webinar on how to flip houses for a real estate profit, you're at the right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're going to be talking about uh, pollinators here today and creating a backyard buzz. And it looks like uh, we have about a dozen folks that are on. So uh, I hope some of you got that joke anyways. Um, I also have with me Debbie uh, in our Illinois office. Uh, Debbie, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie Flegel. I'm the uh, program manager for our Illinois programs for Trees Forever. So I'm Jeff's counterpart in Illinois. And so she's going to be helping me out here today with uh, questions and troubleshooting if anybody has any problems. Uh, the idea here is you should be able to see us and hear us. And in just a minute here, I'll share my screen. Uh, as we get into the uh, the, the training here, um, but we can't hear or see you. So the way that we interact is we have a couple of ways, the chat function, and then we have questions. And so uh, as you can see there, questions is simply just a place to, to type out your questions. We'll be monitoring that uh, throughout the presentation here, and then probably come together at the end uh, with all of the questions on screen and get those answered for folks. and and um, we often have many people that attend these that are much more knowledgeable than I am uh, and even Debbie and so uh, we certainly like to crowdsource things so when we get to the questions and answers don't be bashful about um, either typing in a response or, or letting well I guess that's the only way you can do that is type it in a response I was going to say raise your hand but we can't see you no no indeed well I have 12 noon and I have uh, quite a few of the folks that are registered are with us so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we are going to record this so it'll be available for folks um, to come back and view at another time on our Trees Forever website uh, backslash webinars. So with that, let me get my camera shut down and my screen shared. And I hope Debbie, you'll let me know if you can see my uh, creating a backyard buzz. We good to go, Debbie? Good. Yep. Excellent. Well, Trees Forever and our partners are excited to be creating a buzz and providing this training on pollinators, soil and water, and perennials for pollinator habitat. We have a lot to cover today, so uh, let's get to it. First, a little background about Trees Forever, then we're going to review uh, what exactly we're talking about when we reference pollinators. Next, why are pollinators even important? Then we'll get into the heart of what pollinators need to survive and thrive, uh, some different soil and water interactions with pollinator habitat, and finally, suggestions for attracting pollinators to your backyard. So let me tell you a little bit about the great organization I work for, Trees Forever. Our mission is to plant and care for trees and the environment by empowering people, building community, and promoting stewardship. So Trees Forever was founded in 1989, and since then, uh, we've planted more than 3 million trees. And we do this with a staff of roughly 20, uh, working in Iowa and Illinois. We've participated in national projects and are supported by individuals like you. So what are pollinators? First, we need to set the stage for what we mean when we talk about pollinators. It's crucial to understand that while we talk about pollinators in a general term, pollinators really include many, many different things, right? So most of us are familiar with bees and butterflies, but this also includes more mundane insects like flies and beetles, and moths, and let's not forget about mammals like bats and bears, and yes, even you and me as humans. And even within insects, we have thousands of species that comprise pollinators and have varying life cycles. So this is something we wanna keep in mind this entire uh, presentation and training here, is that pollinators is not one thing, but we talk about it in kind of this umbrella term. Well, I never miss an opportunity to educate folks. Since we're talking about pollinators, I think it's worth remembering 
uh, just what the act of pollination entails. So um, pollinators transfer pollen from the male part of the plant, the anthers, to the female part of a plant, the stigma, resulting in the production of seeds and fruit. So why are pollinators important and why the concern over population declines the last couple of decades? Well, the short answer is that pollinators are absolutely crucial to a healthy ecosystem and food supply. So pollinators are sometimes thought of as the canary in the coal mine and are a key indicator of ecosystem health. The reason is simple, because 90% of wild plants need cross-pollination to survive and reproduce. So when we put pollinators into the, into the overall context of the food system, it's estimated that pollinators are responsible for roughly every third bite of food that we eat. I don't know about you, but I eat quite a bit, so that really adds up, right? So a few facts uh, and figures. Oh, a little slow here. There we go. So a few facts and figures regarding pollinators and our food supply. So roughly 85% of commercially grown crops are insect pollinators, uh, pollinated, pardon me. Pollinators affect roughly 35% of global ag lands. Uh, these are important pollinator services for crops like alfalfa, melons, cranberries, sun, sunflowers, and many more. And just keep this in mind, and this is something that I think is important, um, especially is that the vast majority of pollinators are going to be our wild or native pollinators. So we certainly know about native honeybees, or pardon me, um, managed honeybees, right, for pollination services and for honey, of course, but the majority of pollinators are going to be our wild native ones. So again, a few facts and figures regarding pollinators and their value to society. So you can see that's a pretty big estimate um, of 235 to almost 600 billion worth of annual global food production on the direct contribution of pollinators, right? And then when we think about US pollination specifically, we're looking at about 10 billion annually. And then uh, furthermore, honeybee pollination is worth about uh, $20 billion annually. And so think here about all the pollination services, and then of course, uh, the honey that's produced. So uh, these are large numbers, and, and this is certainly a large industry. So now we have the yellow flashing danger, danger, Will Robinson. So um, we know pollinators are important, but why are they endangered? Well, many, many factors contribute to these declining numbers of pollinators in general, but we do know that these numbers are declining. So you can see some specific examples here among North American native bee spe uh, species, more than half are declining and nearly one in four of native bee species is imperiled and at increasing risk of extinction. So I love this photo because it shows very explicitly the importance of pollination. Insects and other pollinators do this work every day for free as part of their routine. So if we don't have these pollinators, and again, big umbrella, the insects, the mammals, all sorts, if they're not around to do this, someone else has to. And here's a great example of, of hand pollinating all of these blossoms here in looks like to be China or some uh, Southeast Asian country. So um, for whatever reason, if you don't have them, someone's got to take over and do that. So uh, this is a, a nice graph uh, that shows the total area, in this case in hectares, which is occupied by colonies of butterflies, specifically monarch butterflies, overwintering in Mexico. And so we use this as a surrogate to gauge the overall health of the monarch population. And so you can see this overall kind of decline of over 80% on this 20 year average. And sure, things bounce around a little bit, but you can see the, um, the overall decline. However, a wide range of groups are really working hard throughout the Midwest to support monarch butterfly populations. And um, this is a little bit dated here, but back uh, in the uh, winter of 2018-19, we saw a 144% increase in that overwintering area, which was the largest increase in 12 years. 
And a lot of that was attributed to the great work that's being done in the Midwest here for the monarch population. Um, Got to get these uh, updated here, these new figures. So stay tuned for that. So why exactly are we seeing these declines in pollinator numbers? What's going on here? Well, again, there's just many, many factors that uh, play into these population declines of the pollinators that we see. So certainly, we know loss of habitat and seasonal forage is a concern. There's just no doubt about it. So we look at other things like exposure to pesticides and other chemicals. Certainly invasive pests and disease are a problem. And finally, if we look at kind of this overall changing climate, um, this means a changing landscape. And some of these pollinators have very intimate relationships with specific plants. And so we need to keep that in mind um, as we think about specific pollinators, specific plants and their habitats, and keeping them around for the long run because there might not be anywhere else to go for some of these species if they're um, reliant on, a, on a, another host species. And of course, uh, the most famous one is the monarch, which is so um, reliant on the milkweed common milkweed certainly, but uh, the others as well. So what can we do about it, right? Well, if we're to protect pollinators, we need to know what they need and how to protect them. And so basically pollinators need four main things, okay? We're looking at access to forage for the entire growing season, access to nesting sites, trying to protect this undisturbed habitat, and then protection from pesticides. So Let's start with year long forage, okay? Um, pull all my bullets up here. You remember how I mentioned that when we talk about pollinators as a group and in general terms, uh, but pollinators are really comprised of, of the thousands of different species of insects, mammals, birds, etc. Therefore, since we're trying to provide resources for all pollinators, diversity is absolutely crucial, right? So, like in real life, right? Uh, the mantra for real estate is location, location, location. The mantra with pollinators is diversity, diversity, diversity. So a rule of thumb that we like to suggest is including at least three species that bloom early, three that bloom during the middle of the growing season, and then three different species that are gonna bloom later in the fall. Now, the reason for this is simple. It's because we need some sort of, or pardon me, the reason is simple because some of these pollinators have different life cycles, right? So for example, um, in the early part of the year, uh, there's gonna be some species that won't even emerge and, 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 and start their life cycle until early in the year. And they may live their entire life cycle before another species emerges uh, further in the spring, later in the spring, in the summer. And then they may live their entire life cycle and die off before another species might not emerge till late in the, in the summer and into the fall. And so diversity ensures that we essentially have some sort of habitat for all species all year long. And so another good suggestion that we like to make is, is that native seed, um, when we start out, if we can make the native seed mix a little bit heavier on the forbs and flower side of things, um, we can actually do some good because over time, the grasses are going to tend to take over. So if we boost to that initial level of forbs and flowers uh, in that overall mix, we can kind of overcome that, right? And then finally, we want to include a wide range of, of different colors and uh, different heights within that, that mix of seeds. So here's a, a nice matrix, I guess you could say, that presents really a wealth of information on the types of pollinators and, and some of their needs. And so you can see across the top there some of the types of pollinators and then some of those characteristics on the sidebar there. So sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. So pollinators and pollinator habitat, pardon me, is much more than just prairie. So perennials of all types can provide valuable habitat for forage or nesting. So next, we're gonna highlight a few of the trees and shrubs that are going to be particularly useful for pollinator habitat. So first we get to the oaks. And so oaks are the quintessential wildlife plant. Uh, from mammals and birds to a vast diversity of insects, including, of course, bird food, right? 
Experts believe that oak forests support the most diverse flower populations outside of the jungle rainforests of the tropics. And so many of these species evolved to live in the shade of oak trees. And so as you can see there from that little fact, um, over 500 species of butterflies and moths rely on, on, um, on food, on oak leaves to forage on. So I love the pictures uh, absolutely in this presentation. One of the, the real benefits is, is getting to see some of these fantastic photos. And I love this black gum uh, or black tubelo uh, as it may be. And so um, uh, black tubelo is a, okay, get it. Am I gonna get it right here? Polygamo dioecious, I think I did get it right. Producing male and female flowers on separate parts of the tree. So the female flowers are replaced by uh, clusters of these uh, blue black droops, I guess, as it were, the fruit. And it is a moderate, moderately long lived tree, uh, gets anywhere from 40 to 80 feet tall, uh, prefers full sun to light shade. Um, and the deciduous trees, as you can see, are quite colorful during the autumn. Um, all sorts of different colors from golden yellow to orange, even some purples in there. Uh, and then you get some of these different blotches or splotching effect, I guess you could say, uh, with some of the dark droops that stay attached uh, relatively late into the season. Uh, so this is like, again, uh, black gum, sour gum, black tupelo are some of the different names for this tree. But it's a nice, um, a nice tree for pollinators and it likes to attract lots of different bees. So service berry, here's a fantastic uh, agroforestry. Jeff, we lost your sound. Oh, oh no. Can you hear me now? Uh, on my end, nothing, uh, nothing uh, changed. So I'm just going to keep on rolling here. So service berry is an excellent agroforestry uh, uh, plant as well as a landscape plant, known for its attractive flowers, um, and then of course lots of different uh, caterpillars, butterflies, moths. Uh, provides the foliage provides food for them. Uh, I love it because service berries are delicious and they can handle a much wider um, soil type than your blueberries, for instance, which are going to require uh, more acidic soil. So um, a mealyanker, service berry, another great uh, shrub, I guess you could say, or small tree for pollinators. Uh, so button bush. Um, uh, can you? Button bush does well in wet areas uh, in the garden. It's a host Jeff, plant. Can you go back to the service berry because we did not hear that at all? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, I can. Oh, let's back up actually a little bit here. So service berry. Uh, service berry is a great agroforestry or landscape plant. It's got beautiful flowers in the springtime there. Uh, those flowers attract nectar and pollen. Uh, and many bees like to, um, um, uh, are attracted to the, the flowers, certainly. Um, I love it because it, it it's tasty, of course, and you can eat the berries. Um, it's got the great color, as you can see from the picture there. Uh, and it handles a wider range of soils than like your blueberries, which are going to require uh, a, a slightly acidic soil that needs to be amended in some way. So service berry all around for insects, birds, humans is a great uh, shrub or small tree, uh, providing a lot of different benefits, especially to pollinators. So now we get to button bush. And um, the thing to think about with button bush is, is obviously the, the unique little puffballs there, uh, but it does well in wet areas. And so it can do good in the garden. And it's a host plant uh, to the Promethea moth, the Hydrangea sphinx, and the Saddleback caterpillar. So uh, a couple of uh, specific uh, insects that um, it's a host plant for. I mentioned a lot of these have a very intimate relationship with some of these plants, pollinators and plants. Uh, so witch hazel, uh, again, is gonna provide some nectar and pollen late in the season when little else is blooming. These trees can get up to 20 feet tall. It is the last woody plant to bloom in the fall and blooms for about three weeks or so, uh, which basically happens after its leaves have turned yellow and fallen off. So uh, a good late season and it attracts primarily wasps and flies. Uh, but again, all pollinators we need to be providing for year long. Oh, we got skipped over one there. So nine bark, uh, this is a great multi-stem shrub, uh, gets anywhere from three to nine feet tall. Um, the bark on the lower stems is this kind of dark brown or dullish orange color. Uh, it kind of shreds into these thin strips. Uh, so you can kind of see that on the older uh, stems. Young stems um, uh, have round clusters of flowers that are about two to three inches across. It blooms in late spring or early summer, somewhere in there, for about two to three weeks. 
And then later in the summer, the flower clusters get replaced by these kind of um, droops again, greenish, they turn to red fruits. And a lot of different caterpillars of the moth species will actually uh, feed on nine bark. So it's a nice species to put in your backyard um, uh, plantings because it provides a lot of benefit to a wide range of different pollinators. Uh, a couple of grasses here. So uh, this Cytoch grama is gonna provide valuable nesting habitat for ground nesting pollinators. And we'll get to those in just a little bit here. Uh, and of course, those ground nesters required undisturbed areas for the, the labyrinth of tunnels and chambers that they use to lay their eggs and provisions. And as the name implies, you can see why we call it side oats grandma there. So a, a good um, uh, clumping grass. Another great clumping grass is prairie drop seed. And this is one of my uh, favorites. It, it looks nice as, as a bunch grass growing in these kind of attractive clumps. Uh, but in, in the summertime, it also smells like buttered popcorn if you cut it, go out to and cut it and, and smell it. It's one of those real fragrant uh, species that's in our prairie. In this case, it's a grass, um, unlike the bee balm, but uh, yeah, so that's that's a good one. Uh, little blue stem, this is um, uh, provides different um, resources, basically foliage to, to feed on for caterpillars for a wide range of different butterflies, including the skippers. And of course, it's gonna grow in these kind of dense clumps, um, which is gonna help with nesting habitat as well. And it's got a nice pretty color. It's stiff stems to kind of uh, hold it upright uh, during the winter time, so that's nice. Um, this next one, golden alexanders. So this is this is attractive to many kinds of insects that are looking for pollen and nectar. Uh, especially, there's a couple here: the short-tongued bees, the different wasps and flies and beetles. Um, so the mining bee, for instance, is a, is a specialist of golden alexander. Uh, the plant is capable of self-pollination if no pollinators are present, so that's good to know. Um, and this one isn't to be confused with wild parsnip, which is one, of course, that we want to uh, be aware of. Um, this is, um, th th obviously, this is uh, not the one that we have to be uh, 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 concerned with wild parsnip, but uh, this is one that has different caterpillars of the black swallowtail and Ozark swallowtail butterflies, which uh, will feed on the leaves and the flowers. Uh, but it can be mistaken for the wild parsnip uh, oftentimes, but golden alexander. Oh, another stunning photo here. So butterfly milkweed, and this is one that uh, really stands out. So this is the showiest of all the milkweeds, uh, obviously due to its color and the long summer blooming period. Uh, so monarch caterpillars do eat the leaves, and it is a host plant of the monarch butterfly, a queen butterfly as well, and the milkweed tussock moth, interestingly enough. Uh, so this foliage does lack that toxic, milky latex uh, substance that's typical of the other milkweeds. And this is also known as pleurisy root, incidentally. And uh, it has medicinal purposes going way back for treating pleurisy. Um, so the people would essentially eat this bitter tasting root um, as, as a medicine. So interestingly enough. Oh boy, another absolutely stunning prairie plant is the uh, blazing star. Uh, so this one is going to bloom toward the end of summer and early autumn, and just provides excellent forage resources during a really crucial time of the year. And, and a lot of times you will see um, clumps of Liatris blazing star just absolutely inundated with butterflies and, and other bees and, and insects because it is a superstar and one that should be in most prairies, <clears throat> personally. So New England Aster, this is a great one here. Um, male bees are a common visitor. They feed on the nectar while waiting to mate with the females. Uh, New England aster is a, a larval host plant for the pearl crescent butterfly and the Canadian sonia moth. And so it provides pollen and nectar to a wide variety of bees and flies and beetles and, and skippers and so on. So another one of those late season um, um, uh, blooming plants. So next we come to access to nesting sites. And this is the next item that's absolutely critical uh, for, oh, pardon me, there we go. Absolutely critical for pollinator habitat. So pollinators can be cavity nesters, certainly, or they can be the ground nesters. So cavity nesters are gonna use these naturally occurring crevices or boreholes uh, created by others typically to lay their young in these different chambers. And we can see an example of that on the left-hand side there. It looks like some bamboo or some other type of uh, woody stem. 
then we get to ground nesters and so the ground nesters are going to use this system of tunnels and in this labyrinth i guess i call them with tunnels and chambers to house their eggs and larvae uh typical typically made by some other creature right um they kind of uh, take over or the offshoot certainly of their own but when we think about cavity nesters versus uh ground nesters uh, about 4,000 native bee species, roughly 70%, are nest uh, ground nesters, pardon me, and they don't really travel very far, uh, only 200 to 300 yards. So by and large, these native bee species uh, are going to nest in the ground, which absolutely means that undisturbed area, undisturbed habitat is absolutely vital for good pollinator habitat. So think of dead trees, brush piles, tall grasses, ground litter. All of this is going to provide crucial home for these little critters. So think of, for example, about the queen rusty patch bumblebee, which was one of those species of concern um, in Iowa here. So it spends its winters basically hunkered down in about three centimeters of dirt uh, under the duff layer you know, out in the woods. And this is enough to insulate it long enough to be nice and toasty during the harsh winter and, and ready to emerge and, and, and uh, and start a colony in the spring. So um, again, this undisturbed habitat, very important, especially when we consider that a lot of our native bees are ground nesters. So the next thing was we need to provide undisturbed habitat uh, to provide overwintering, nesting habitat, and protect pollinators and other beneficial insects for that matter uh, from pesticides and, and, other, and other chemicals. So, um, one of my favorite photos. So they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Standing perennials are gonna provide the habitat that a lot of these pollinators need. So here's this little leaf cutter bee larvae, uh, warm and toasty inside a stem, just waiting for the days to get longer and spring to arrive. Um, so fantastic uh, example of leaving that over the winter, standing instead of cutting it. Uh, another uh, opportunity for pollinator habitat for nesting here in an undisturbed habitat is these pollinator, whether, whether you call them bee houses or hotels or simply structures, right? They're basically made of these natural materials and they accommodate these solitary nesting bees and other pollinators by providing those cavities for them to live in and raise their young. So a couple of things to think about uh, when we, if you're going to go ahead and do something like a bee house is to use untreated lumber first and foremost, that's extremely important so that we don't inadvertently poison or, or um, damage uh, some of the insects that might be attracted to it. Um, then make the holes in the wood anywhere from six to eight inches deep uh, and use different sizes because again, we're not looking for one particular species, but a wide range of species that are gonna be all different sizes, right? All different bees and other insects come in a variety of sizes. So the other thing to keep in mind is the, the roof. So the bee house really should have a roof with at least a two to four inch overhang, protecting the holes from rain, keeping things dry, right? So if we look at this particular example here, this kind of habitat house, I guess you could say, it's made of all sorts of layers of pallets. And then in between the pallets, you can see are, are some bricks, uh, some different wood and, and just logs, I guess you could say, uh, some flowering pots containing a whole variety of different plant stems and pine needles and pine cones and other just natural materials, I guess you could say. Um, and this is going to be used by all sorts of insects and, and birds, certainly, and amphibians and reptiles and mammals, all sorts of different critters. If you look on the uh, dead branch, in fact, in the upper right-hand corner of the house, um, it's really hard to see, but there's a praying mantis, um, a praying mantis that you can see there. So and it's hard to make out, but it's there, I assure you. <laughs> so finally, protection from um, pesticides, right? Uh, that's the other thing that we need to keep in mind. And this may sound like I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, if you're not familiar with this, you probably should. Um, and it bears repeating, the label is the law when it comes to utilizing some of these pesticides, uh, either on a large scale of, as a farmer or as a backyard, uh, backyard grower. Uh, you need to read and abide by the label. Uh, the label is the law. If I were in class right now, I'd have you repeat after me, the label is the law, right? So for example, um, when we think about exposing insect pollinators to pesticides, the timing, right, is often going to be important. And so that label is going to express um, when we should utilize the product in re uh, relation to the blooming stage of the crop and other plants. 
because we certainly don't want to be utilizing some of these products on blooming plants that are actually attracting some of the pollinators, right? So in a similar fashion, we want to follow all label requirements regarding the conditions, the application conditions. So like wind, uh, wind direction, temperature, relative humidity, especially whether it's going to rain or not. Um, a lot of it comes down to common sense. So some common sense steps can go a long way to minimizing drift and undue exposure. And again, the label is the law. So if you're going to use some of these products, it's important that you read the label and understand that that is um, the way that they need to be utilized. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do on your farm to attract pollinators. So it all begins with the right plant, <clears throat> excuse me, let me wet my whistle here. <clears throat> it all begins with right plant, right place. So know your piece of ground. Uh, is it high and dry? Is it low and moist? Uh, this is going to influence the species composition, composition pardon me, that's going to uh, thrive in that particular area. Um, that is the underlying soil type is going to be important for the site. And then knowing if it's full sun, partial shade, another component to think about. Um, if, we look, if we look, pardon me, at what sort of seed we're looking to put in, uh, to the extent you can, we want to strive for local ecotype plants. And a plant, um, pardon me, plant, a range of different plant sizes from the large cup plant, uh, compass plant, uh, for example, to rattlesnake master and smaller species like lead plant. Uh, again, getting a mix of different heights is gonna be important for diversity. You know, you don't have to have a large yard to plant pollinator habitat. I think that's important, okay? So add native plants to your flower beds. Uh, try to minimize the use of mulch, pack stuff in there, right? Um, the prairie is an intensely, um competitive place and so there's hardly anything not growing in the prairie so don't be bashful about packing a lot of plants in there um, ground nesters are going to have access um, to those bare spots and be able to utilize them but they don't need a lot of of of, of, of pardon me a lot of room so if we plant uh, nine different species three early three mid three late at a, at a minimum that's going to provide some decent pollinator habitat at least something will be there all year round and from a minimum, I guess, of nine all the way up to these exotic uh, 30, 40, 50, 80 uh, seed species mixes, um, the more you can get in there, the better diversity, the better, certainly. Um, let's see here. Finally, you know, be an advocate for pollinators. Talk to your neighbors, friends, and family about the importance of native plants. Create corridors of, of, of native plantings throughout your block or neighborhood. Uh, talk to your local elected officials, you know, uh, that's something else you can do to educate them on the value of, of natives in, in our public places. You can plant rain gardens or butterfly gardens throughout the community or on public property. Basically, just to the best that you can, get involved. A quick shout out to uh, some of our partners here, uh, United States Department of Agriculture through a, a, a CIG grant, uh, Syngenta and Gromark, Operation Pollinator, we really appreciate that. Um, we have some questions and answers. Uh, so let's see what we have here in regard to questions and answers. Can you hear me, Debbie? Yes, I can. So we have do we have any questions? We do through. have a, we do have a couple questions. Um First one is from Elizabeth Hamilton. She says, hello all and thank you for hosting this and for our terrific work with trees. She's an arborist and a plant ecologist, so part of the choir that we speak to, so to speak. And she would like to hear more about how we help ensure the healthy management and aging of the trees that we plant. Oh, great question. Kind of an overall general question, I think, for Trees Forever. So keep in mind um, that Trees Forever really works. We're a volunteer-based organization. And so I didn't, I'm not sure I mentioned this earlier in, in who Trees Forever is, but one of the things we, we do is certainly work with volunteers within communities and provide a lot of pass-through grant funding for things like um, the utility companies, our community forestry program. Uh, they can plant uh, trees for energy efficiency. Certainly when we work with rural landowners who are working watersheds, buffers and beyond, or Illinois Buffer Partnership Program, uh, we're working directly with landowners there. So generally speaking, 
we're working with volunteers and landowners who want those trees there and so do take an ownership role in helping to care and maintain those uh, those trees that we plant. Uh, we can't guarantee it obviously and, and we do certainly do follow-ups uh, when we're back in communities when doing other projects or we do do follow-ups with rural landowners for our buffer program and, and so on and so forth. So we really work within the volunteers uh, the cities, the landowners that work with us to do those plantings to keep them maintained. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's basically how we do things here at Trees Forever because volunteerism is so important to us. The simple act of planting the tree can really have profound impacts and it can be a real um, imprint on young minds. There's been more than once where I've heard individuals, I work with a lot of high school kids that uh, we do plantings in different communities and they'll maybe come back and say, oh, there's that tree that I planted when I was in, uh, you know, a sophomore in high school. And so we love to hear that because they remember that experience, it stays with them and, and hopefully they pay it forward then, so. I'd just like to add on that, um... Elizabeth, we stress through Trees Forever, we stress maintenance is maintenance and taking care of your trees and your plants is just as important as planting them. So um, we do stress that through all of our programs and all of our um, presentations that maintenance is just as important. We have an, a comment from Christine. Um, for those in Iowa, you can register your butterfly garden with the Blank Park Zoo's Plant Grow Fly program. So for those of you located in Iowa, and that's really, here we go, uh, Mike, thank you. Um, a little bit of habitat goes a long way and you are absolutely correct. Uh, even if you have a three by three space, five by five, eight by eight, 10 by 10, don't be afraid to start small and then expand as you can. Absolutely, that's what, you know, it doesn't take a huge space to, to plant a few different plants and provide some habitat for pollinators. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask? If so, go ahead and type them in the question box or the chat, either one. But that's right now, yeah. that's what we have. We should take an opportunity to let folks know that we have a, a an absolutely exciting, fascinating a webinar coming up here uh, in two weeks. No, not quite two weeks, two weeks from yesterday on pruning your trees and shrubs. And so uh, this is the time of year that we should be out there pruning a lot of our different trees and shrubs. And so this is gonna be a great webinar on that. Um, check it out on the Trees Forever website, get registered if you're interested and uh, stay tuned for a lot more webinars coming out uh, this uh, later this winter and spring. So. Uh, no shortage of topics to uh, present on, and, and that's for sure. And we welcome your feedback as well. Um, so if folks uh, received um, a link for a uh, pre-workshop survey and a post-workshop survey, we would uh, much appreciate any sort of a feedback that you can give us. So We do have um, just a, a comment from Joe Dillon asked if uh, the slide that showed the chart of the different pollinator types with other information, if that came from pollinator.org, and if you are correct, it did come from that website. Yep, that was on the, the slide itself. That's a great resource, pollinator.org, among many okay. others, definitely. Thank you for um, all of your, your comments here, complimenting the great information that they want to share with their volunteers. Um, yes, please, please feel free to share our information. Um, Elizabeth is going to cite Trees Forever when she uses some of this information on her blog posts at betternature.solutions. We appreciate that very much. Uh, the next, let's see, Cynthia cannot find the next webinar. So on, if you go to treesforever.org forward slash webinar, is that correct? That's the, the link. I, I believe so. You should also be able to click on it in the upper right hand corner. Uh, there'll be a calendar and there'll be a drop down. And one of the things is the webinar page. And so on the webinar page is a, is a listing of some um, webinars that are 
open for registration now. And then more importantly, some of our past webinars, which are recorded, this will be one of them. This should be up within a couple of days here. Uh, but we have a, a library of, of former uh, webinars, everything from the different programs we have here at Trees Forever uh, to, again, pollinator presentations, um, how to do a roadside plan for your community and make them eligible for grant funding uh, for uh, native plantings, uh, trees included. So um, that webinar page is, is, is important because it has the registration link and then it has all of our past, a link to our past webinars as well. Uh, Cynthia, if you're still not able to find it, um, Jeff left his email up here on the screen. So just send a quick email and we'll send you the link if you're still not able to find it. A uh, question from Catherine, what is the best way to start a small garden in the yard that is just now grass? What do you do? Do you add soil? How do you kill the grass? So uh, I'll take a stab at this and it really depends on uh, how you want to do it, how you want to go about it. So if you want to use some Roundup and, and torch it and, and kill it with some chemical, you can do that. If you don't and it's a small enough area, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of using um, sheet mulch, so cardboard. So again, if we don't let any sunlight hit this grass, it's going to die, right? So um, go out there in the springtime, uh, put out some cardboard, collect it from wherever you can find it, um, uh, Dollar General, the, the grocery store, whatever, if you buy a new fridge or a, a dehumidifier, but keep that cardboard, lay that down, um, because that's eventually going to decompose, but it's also going to kill all the grass below it because they won't have any access to sunlight. And that's a really good way to just turn that into the soil then. Um, once you can get your soil prepared, right, and probably doing some, um, maybe some amendments to it, getting some good pollen soil to mix in with it. Uh, if you want to go so far as to do a soil test, depending on where you're at, you know, keep in mind that if you're in an urban setting, urban settings just notoriously have just trash soil. The developers have stripped away the good stuff. They've backfilled with all sorts of, of, of less than desirable, good quality soil. And so if you're in an urban setting, most likely you just don't have a lot to work with. So a lot of times it's, it's advantageous to maybe do some amendments, whether it's some potting soil or some um, high quality uh, compost or something like that. Uh, but work that up real good and, uh, and then essentially turn yourself free. So either do a direct seeding with just the seeds that are going to be spread out there, or you could look at doing some uh, plugs or, or um, potted plants, whatever the, the case may be and what you desire. So. Another option too is that you could do solarization, which is similar to smothering with the cardboard, only you're using like a, a plas piece of plastic and basically you're you're holding that down, um, like maybe putting bricks on the edge of it and basically baking the area throughout the heat of the summer. And then it would be ready to plant in the fall. So Ideally, if you want to start, you would start with your site preparation this spring, which would be killing the grass in one way or shape or another, whether you use the Roundup or some other type of herbicide. Um, and if you do use herbicide, it's recommended that you wait two weeks, a minimum, and then treat it again. So you want to treat it multiple times before you think about planting. So ideally you would do your site preparation this spring for planting in the fall. Uh, another question we have from Dennis is, uh, when do you trim back perennials? When do you trim back? Yes, when do you cut back your perennials? If you leave them standing over winter, when do you cut them down? Oh, I, I guess you were saying, um, great question. And I'm not sure I have a, an a absolute answer for that because it really is going to depend on what the perennial is, um, letting them go over the winter. The whole point there is to try to let the plant be utilized as a pollinator resource. Uh, obviously, as the new materials, uh, the new growth starts to come up, we need to cut the old growth out. So certainly uh, sometime in the spring there, uh, but I think that's really going to depend on, on what the, uh, the plant is overall on pruning. Uh, dormant season is a great time to be pruning <clears throat> trees and is the absolute only time we should be pruning some trees. And to learn more about that, join us for our Pruning Trees and Shrubs webinar coming up here in two weeks from yesterday. So on, uh, I would just like to add, as far as leaving your overwintering stems standing, your dead plants in your, in your flower bed, is that you, should, you could, um, in the spring, you want to cut them down about half 
you don't want to completely remove them. Um, you want to cut the size down to about half. And that way your, your new plants are starting to come up in the spring. That way you still leave some of the stems, the hollow stems for um, those pollinators that haven't emerged yet in the spring. So you want to leave them and then gradually you cut them back throughout the year. There is a, a great resource from uh, Heather Holm who has several uh, books on pollinators and their association with various plants. And she has a um, great resource and a great visual on um, when to cut your plants back. We do have a question from Rick. Uh, what suggestions do you have for keeping grass from taking over your pollinator beds? Is burning one option? Yes, but that's really going to be dependent on where you live and your neighbors and, and those types of things. Uh, so a couple of strategies for trying to, first and foremost, not let the grass get established is just packing those plants in there. Um, if you're going to do a direct seeding right away, it's a matter of good weed management. And if, if an area gets taken over with grass or something like that, get it removed. Uh, turf grass is highly competitive, obviously. Um, in general, for weeds, we just want to keep that pollinator plot mowed, uh, you know, relatively, again, if a direct seeding is the case, because the direct seeding takes time. You know, we're looking at two to three years to get those plants up and coming, and we need to control those weeds early. And so uh, within that context, um, we want to be mowing, you know, anywhere from four to eight inches high. But the grass within that is really a competition thing. So if we can pack the plants in there, there's no place for it to get established. Uh, if we can do some hand removal, that would be good as well. Um, no good answers. There's no magic bullet, that's for sure. Anything to add, Debbie? There's a yeah, question about I, burlap. I, I, uh, I struggle. Snack. I struggle with that as well for my own. I have a small pollinator plot I take care of at my parents' house. And yeah, I struggle with grass. So I'm out there weeding, hand pulling as much as I can. Um, I do burn it in this in the uh, early spring, late winter. Um, but still, it it still I still am out there constantly pulling grass. So it's a, a constant battle. Um, but if you don't take care of it, it just the grass is gonna take over. We do have a question um, from Cami. There are many cultivars and new varieties of native plants, especially coneflower. Will you mention that many new cultivars are not as attractive to pollinators? And then what is the best type of service berry plant? Well, I guess my only real comment is uh, native. So um, preferably not a, a named variety, um, um, but I guess something's better than nothing if we look at it in that regards. Um, and I don't know that I have a best service berry as far as a variety goes with that either. Um, I'm sure there are some named varieties, but uh, I don't happen to know any off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, there, are about, there are about 20 different types of, of service berry. So any, um, pretty much any of them are good for pollinators. Just depends on what the type you're looking for. As far as the, the cultivars of native plants, those are called nativars. And um, as Jeff mentioned, something is better than nothing. Um, if they can be used in combination with the native plants, um, but don't rely on them solely. Um, I just throw out a, a quick comment. We were at a park um, for a staff meeting and they had native our uh, coneflowers and native coneflowers. So they had purple coneflower, they had a uh, gray headed coneflower, which is yellow, they had a native R, which was white, and they had another native R, which was burgundy color. And so, just as a, a caveat, um, while we were there, the there were only insects on the purple coneflower and the gray-headed coneflower. There were zero insects on the white or the burgundy color, and those were both native R's. So 
as long as you're using them in conjunction with native plants, they're fine to use, but don't solely rely on them to provide the pollen and nectar that the insects need. See, the Debbie, there's a question about a recommendation on where to get seeds or plant plugs for Iowa native plants. And so just to segue from the cultivar discussion, uh, that was from Paige. And so we do have a resource on our website. Uh, we have a pollinator toolkit that has all sorts of great resources uh, from a lot of from other entities on essentially tips and tricks to establish pollinator habitat. And on that one specifically, uh, we direct you to UNI and the Tallgrass Prairie Center because they have a great resource that lists contractors that can help you get started with doing plantings if you wanna go that route. It also has native seed producers that sell seed and plugs and stuff like that. Uh, in my neck of the woods up here in Northwest Iowa, we have the Prairie Flower uh, just south or north of Spencer, uh, which is a great resource for the Great Lakes area, uh, potted plants. Um, Ion Exchange is one that comes to mind, but there's others that are out there. But that UNI Tallgrass Prairie Center on their website and then we have a link to it again on the pollinator toolkit that's on our website uh, so i would strongly encourage you to take a look at that because i think there's over a dozen great documents um, uh, on that pollinator toolkit um let's see mike commented that the derecho has an unplanned opportunity to plant new native trees shrubs and perennials absolutely um, speak a little bit on layering overstory, understory, tall and short shrubs, perennials, and ground cover. Oh, we must have a uh, permaculturalist here. Okay. Uh, well, as you as you lay out, uh, so there's many different layers within the forest that we can plant different things from the uh, the tall hardwoods providing shade to the understory, uh, and all the way down to those things that grow underground. Um, so it's it's really a blank slate, as you say. What do you want? What's important to you? Um, if you want to get into the whole guilds, you know, there's uh, some resources out on the internet uh, for trying to find um, uh, different plants that work well together. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, I, I agree with you. There's an opportunity out there. Uh, so right tree, right place, right plant, right place. Can you share the best way to donate to Trees Forever? Well, you can send a check to Jeff Jensen. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, our website, I think, would probably be the best. Um, there's, I think there's a mechanism there where you can donate um, to, to Trees Forever. If it's a, a larger gift that you want to direct uh, in, in some way, shape, or form, uh, I would say get in contact with uh, Lisa Williams, our development director, uh, and she's on our staff page at Trees Forever. Uh, she'd be able to talk with you if you wanted to do something um, on a large scale. And then, of course, if not, just on our website. Can you clarify what a local ecotype plant is? Well, Debbie, you want to give that one a shot? Sure. <laughs> so uh, local, the, uh... local ecotype means that the plant is adapted and native to your region. So generally when we say um, local ecotype, generally means that it's within found within 250 miles of where you live. So ideally what that means is you are purchasing or buying plants, whether they be prairie uh, plants or trees or shrubs, that the seed source comes from within 250 miles of where you live. So you're not buying a prairie plant that originated in Texas to plant in the middle of Illinois or Iowa. Okay, so so that's what ecotype is. It, it's it's uh, regionally adapted to your uh, the amount of moisture your area gets, as well as the amount of um, the temperature, the climate. But it's the local seed source comes from within 250 miles of where you live. That's the, the shortest, sweetest answer, I guess. There you go. The closer you can source that seed from where you live, the better. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there was a couple of posts here on a good site for service berries for this region, and it was a Master Gardener uh, University of Wisconsin extension. So uh, Google service berry um, University of Wisconsin extension, and there's a, a good uh, site that you can look up some information. Thank you, Joe, for providing that. And then Christine mentions that zoos and aquariums accredited through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums have pollinator friendly programs. So if you live outside of Iowa, check with the local zoo to um, essentially see what they have going on. Um, we're all trying to work together to save the monarchs and songbirds for sure. So thank you, Christine, absolutely. 
there was a comment on asking about the books from Heather Holm. And if I'll, you have them handy, I don't I mind do. it downstairs. I do, just hold on a second. Turn my video off. Okay, well, while Debbie's doing that, I'm gonna sing you a song. No, I'm just kidding. I won't uh, I won't expose you to that. Let's see if we got any more questions coming through here. Oh, the burlap, uh, someone said the local coffee house has um, <clears throat> mentioned that using burlap from their large coffee bean bags is a good weed barrier. And uh, I think that has some potential. Um, it would take a while to break down, but eventually it should, uh, since it's burlap. Um, just keep it out of the mower as best you can, I think, certainly. So, Debbie. so this, this is one, Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. This is one of her books. Uh, this is a great resource. Um, it lists by... Uh, plant. I don't know if you can see that. And then it tells which pollinators need this, that species. Her other book that um, is the identification of bees. Let's see here. An identification and native plant forage guide for bees. So both of these are great resources that you could to use to, uh, and these are Midwest. She's originally from Minnesota. So these are Midwest based species. I think we've hit everything so far. Oh, can you put those in the chat? Can we type those in? Uh, let's, um, Debbie, can you double click on the question that asked about the books and then actually type in the names? I believe it was Joe. Yes, as soon as I find it again. Uh, someone is, uh, Joe, has not, not finding the pollinator toolkit on the website. Yeah, well, let me actually see if we're sharing screen here. Uh, maybe I can bring it up. Trees forever. Uh, let me uh, cancel my webcam here. Get rid of this. Uh, no, what we do. Pollinator habitat conservation. Oh. Let's see, pollinators, here we go. But it's not creating a buzz. Well, let's do a pollinator uh, toolkit search. Here we go, pollinator plus toolkit. Ah, very good. So here are all the different resources we have, uh, downloadable materials, the field watch flyer, list of recommended trees and shrubs, um, um, planting natives into prairie cool season sod, uh, high diversity monarch seed mix, just absolutely fantastic resources here. So here's the Iowa Prairie Seed Vendors and Service Providers. Again, a link to the UNI Tallgrass Prairie Center who puts that together. So there's the uh, Pollinator Plus Resource Toolkit.
Hope that was helpful. Okay, hey, that looks like all of the questions. So thank you everyone for joining us over your lunch hour today. I typed in the book names in the chat so you can get those. I think if you just uh, Google Heather Holm, they'll come up to her website and you can get that information from there as well. But these are great resources if you're just starting out wanting some additional information. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.